bill comes in the House of Reaction for his votes for his evidence. All right, I think we're going to uh, get started now. My name is Elizabeth Abrams. I'm the provost of Merrill College, and I'm very pleased to be able to introduce this program. Uh, this is, um, we are now several years into, um, uh, I think what we can call the uh, King-Merrill joint um, a production uh, that uh, has, has led to the Noel Q. King Memorial Lecture annually for the last several years. Um, and um, I especially want to thank the King family, Lori King, Zoe King, Nathan King, uh, for, uh, for sponsoring this event, uh, for keeping alive uh, the memory and spirit of Noel King and his connection to Merrill College. Uh, and I especially also want to thank our distinguished guest today, Mercy Odoyuye. Uh, from the University of Ghana, uh, who will be speaking. Um, Lori King will be introducing the lecture. Um, we will have time for question and answer uh, at my home afterwards, to which you're um, all invited to a reception, uh, or possibly also um, after the lecture today. I'm really delighted to see you here. Thank you so much for coming. And please, uh, let's welcome Lori King. Thank you, Elizabeth. It's so it's so lovely that uh, that Merrill has made a an annual welcome for the, the King lectures uh, to find a home here at, at UC Santa Cruz. The Noel King lecture series started as a way to keep religious studies presence on the Santa Cruz campus, which has not been an easy process. Uh, many of us who did uh, uh, BAs in the Comparative Religion program went on to other careers, including to Noel's constant befuddlement, his wife. Um, <laughs> although, as a, as a crime writer, I have to say that everything I do is shaped by my theology degrees. Um, there's a, less obvious difference between a life of crime and a life of, life of God than you, than you would think. <laughs> uh, uh, the other former students, however, seized their experiences in the study of religion and made it their life's work, much as Noel himself did, taking a childhood in India a degree in church history and an Anglican ordination, and using those to shape generations of students, African and American around a life of religious awareness and dialogue. This was really the kind of student that Noel could understand. He never really got fiction. <laughs> and without a doubt, one of the stars in his firmament was a young woman named Mercy Yamoa Odubigi. Mercy was a joy to Noel, a Ghanaian woman of deep faith and considerable academic rigor, who went on to speak truth to the churches of the world. I am so pleased that as Noel got his theological hook into her six decades ago, we managed to talk her into coming to give his memorial lecture today. Mercy. questions asked or unasked were responded to with riddles, proverbs, and stories, but mostly the latter. I have carried on the telling of stories as my main means of communication. The hearers, when intrigued, 
would exceed it where appropriate, and often one ends with the traditional tales. That is why the elders say, you tell your own story and it always ends with, that is why the elders say. My childhood included English nursery rhymes and stories. One title I still remember is The Quiet Soul Stories, <coughs> told to open up the origins and reasons of childhood enigmas. <coughs> When I remember NQK, as we called him, it has been invariably the question put to me as, why did you study theology? The answer is simply this. NQK called me into the study of divinity at the University of University College, Legon, Accra. He called many into theology and mentored many in his lifetime, certainly in Ghana and Uganda, but also I think in the Pacific and Asia. Ending up in California where I caught up with him, having missed him on the grand tour he made of his students sometime before. That encounter is urged in my heart. And UK gave me a treat, including a visit to the aquarium to marvel at the freedom of fishes and to lick ice cream. <laughs> I felt like a grandchild enjoying the company of grandpa. In 1959, to a woman in the Gold Coast, Gold Coast that had just turned Ghana, it was a pertinent question to ask enrolling at a Department of Divinity, a theological college, a denominational seminary to study divinity was an indication that one is aspiring to join the ordained ministry of the church. In the first coast of the 1950s, and even in the Ghana of the 60s, ordination of women into the sacramental ministry of the Christian church was not on the drawing board. So, why did NQK call me to study in the Department of Divinity in the university? And why did I respond in the affinity? Now, here's the story. I had completed secondary school at Achimota School with a Cambridge School Certificate. And I had entered teacher training college at what is now the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, and had obtained a teacher certificate A after two years. Armed with this, the Ministry of Education, which had sponsored my training, saddled me with a five-year bond to teach. I had been posted to Asawasi Methodist Girls School and was happily teaching Standard 7 that is the top class that had girls aged 15 to 17. It was my father, minister of the Methodist Church, who had directed me to this career track. The alternatives for me had been nursing, whose entrance exam I had passed, and sixth form, for which I had obtained a place in Infant Spim with a science option. Infant Spim was a boys' school, it still is. But as Wesley Girls High School in the same town was a sister institution that offered sister form but did not have science option, those of us who were to go to Wesley Girls for science, we lived in Wesley Girls and went to school in Infant Spim. Now, why I had to go to Pantipim and to Wesley Hills when I'm coming from what was supposed to be prime, the top school, a Chimotor school that had everything, is another story I cannot tell here. <laughs> now, what I would have done at the university with my sixth form certificate, I now do not recall. 
but certainly it was not to lead me to the Department of Divinity. As it happened, my father directed that I do home study to qualify me for the university while I teach and make a home for four other girls, three siblings and a cousin. I had just turned 21. Home study for me at that time precluded the science track as I would not have access to a laboratory. My father ensured that I stayed on his agenda for me by enrolling me in Wolsey Hall Distance Learning of the University of London. They sent me lectures, I read, they sent me questions, I did essays, they marked, and that's how he got on. I complied with my father's directions, as young people were expected to do in those days. <laughs> I had by this means obtained three A-levels in the General Certificate of Education in London. The three included my favorite subject at school, geography. The other two were economics and British constitution. Now, if you are wondering about the latter, Remember, I was still in the country under British rule, and I was intrigued by the fact that a people who had no written constitution could still have a body of knowledge to teach. I think this is what later became political science. And since politics and talk of crafting a constitution for the nation was in the air, I was breathing in that period I found it intriguing to, to do this kind of study. Then was economics. Now, why did I do economics? I don't know. I mean, um, I guess the fascination for economics was because you needed three subjects, and I had one, and I didn't know <laughs> what the others were going to be. But the British Constitution studies was the beginning of my fascination with oral history. It was the beginning of experiencing the power of oral tradition, the seeds of which were the childhood folk tales and proverbs, the akan oral tradition that I had drunk through stories began to have meaning. I recognized them as the very substance of the cultural text that I continued to study. Geography was a passion. After all, being a Wesleyan, the world was my parish. And in my parents' trail, I had become accustomed to moving around the country and experiencing the varied topography of my homeland. In later life, my passion for justice and advocacy for the excluded, led many to ask me, why don't you go into politics? With my economics, I do not know, but only that I found myself inadvertently agreeing to supply Africa's lack of a woman trained in theology, thanks to NQK. My father was a Methodist minister who had just returned from Richmond College, London with a BD and was teaching at Trinity College in Kumasi. In 1955, he had helped me set up this uh, abode, my home, near the school where I taught and left me with the four girls, as I said. And he had gone off to Richmond in London and my mother to Kingsmead in Birmingham. And there I was, uh, a big mother of a household of five women, me being the head of the household. Um, I would have done to go to the sixth form, but later in life I realized that this was all to fit into my father's own plans of getting a BD. But that's what we used to do when we were young, we just fitted into your parents' plans. Not but it wasn't all that bad for me because teaching 
with A levels. My earnings at that time was not to be sneered at. And I was very happy with my work. It was fun teaching in the middle school. The girls were aged between 13 and 17 when I had turned 21 and really feeling big. I was immersed in the school, clubs, Red Cross, Girl Guide, the church, the youth club, anything going, I was there. My house was always like the venue of a girls' club and homeware center because of the girls that were under my care. But my eyes were still on the university. One morning, I was in front of the blackboard with both my hands covered with white chalk. I was told not to say blackboard, but that's what we always say before it became politically incorrect. <laughs> I spied through the window, and here was this loose, limbed white man with a large head that sported what looked like a lion's mane. <laughs> Minutes later, he was at my door, having gone first to the head teacher's office as any polite visitor would do, dropping my chair, my chalk and duster on the teacher's desk. I walked to meet him at the door. Are you messing up? I just nodded. Uh, can I help you? He responded, Well, I'm coming from your father. These are his words. I'm coming from your father. I went to ask him whether he would have any objection to your coming to Lebanon to study in the Department of Divinity. You see, I saw your name on the list of those who have passed the university entrance examination and thought you might want to study theology. Your father's response was, she's of age. She can speak for herself. So I have come to ask you. I, theology, I don't know. I must have hesitated a little bit and then I said, oh, I think I know what all this is about. Those scribblings that I have seen on my father's desk, Maybe that is what all this theology is about. And those scriptures tend up to be Greek and Hebrew. Which my father was studying to get his intermediate beauty. And here I was saying, yeah, now I've got him. I'll keep up with him. Now all these fancy things that he knows that I don't know. I can't articulate all this, but I think it was part of why I agreed with Noel to go and study theology. At the beginning of the first semester of the academic year 1959-60, I found myself the only woman in a class of 15 or so men, most of them like me, with teacher certificates, being prepared for an intermediate PT certificate of the University of London. The rest, as they say, is history, but I do not have the energy to do research, so I'll continue with my story technique. The study of religion is in the educational curriculum of Ghana from the very beginning to the university. So if you are studying theology, it had nothing to do with going to be a pastor. So going to be a pastor was not part of my issue. Thanks to Noel, who called me into the Department of Divinity of the Faculty of Arts in the University College of the Gold Coast Lagos and Accra, which was in special relations with London at that time. Here was I studying for a degree in theology in this state university. I'm not even sure what subjects Noel lectured in, but my memory goes to early church history, biblical and historical theology. Maybe because the latter, the biblical and historical theology, fascinated me most. I was intrigued in this study by those bishops who had to go to Nicaea for a conference, creating the Nicene Creed and this and that, and because they were so scared, they fell sick or something and never showed up. <laughs> so then, as, as I've been going through Sunday school and, and, and I go to church and I've been 
repeating the Apostles' Creed and Nicene Creed and, and had read a little bit of the Bible and discovered that these things were not in the Bible. You open the Bible and you don't see the Apostles' Creed and Nicene Creed and all of that. I was intrigued with that subject and said, where did these creeds come from? So the study of the church's dogmatics, what the church wants you to believe, is what I went on to do. But in the department where Noel taught during that time, we had the Christian studies, the Bible studies, the languages, the associated histories. We also had Islamic studies. We had African traditional religion and comparative religions were introduced. We had rudiments of Buddhism, Hinduism, Sikhism, and others. All these combined to shape for me a mind attuned to interreligious relations and the acceptance of a multi religious world as a gift from God, which the human community I had been born into was an example. Accepting multi religious living means recognizing the other as imaging God to the best of their ability. So I try to do so. So when I think of NQ King, I think of the relevance of the study of religion in the human relations and humanity's relation to the environment that the divine has placed us in. There are many biblical passages that lend weight to what is known as apocalyptic theology. Humans cannot know God, and the less we pretend to understand God, the better. And yet, here we are, always talking about God, and as such, the human community sometimes tries to run itself as a theocracy. It is God who is the real Language about God in the catapathic theology all agree that all our language about God is metaphor. God is spirit and human language cannot claim to adequately depict God. Yet, God is presented as being male and this has resulted in androcentrism that dominates human society. If God is male, then the male is God. This feminist observation has called forth intensive study. So calling women into theology means recognizing that women have a stake in the naming of the divine. Men should not be set up as the definition makers for the entire human community. So we see women like Elizabeth Johnson, what they have made of this issue of naming God. We, women and men, anchor our connectedness to God with the fact that our being present in creation is the act of God. We acknowledge the inadequacy of human language to name the beyond, the transcendent, the tremendous luminous that fascinates us and draws us into the awesome one. In the consciously pluralistic world of Ghana, all the names of God are accepted as referring to the beyond. Many saintly scholars, and I've just heard about Noel King being saint. I mean, I belong to the school that thinks he is saint. I know some people don't belong to the school. I do. <laughs> Many saintly scholars like Noel King have mentored scholars in the theology that is not iconoclastic, but truly and deeply spiritual. Appropriating the word God becomes simply spiritual. It becomes a name that gives meaning to life. God, in spite of our philosophical musings, remains God who is in relationship with the whole creation and who expects humans to be stewards of one another and of the environment in which we are placed. Called to study in the Department of Divinity, I studied the humans that, made, that are made in the image and likeness of God, searched for creativity and integrity and compassion in myself 
in other women as well as men. I saw it for the good and the beautiful in all persons and situations, always asking myself, who defines these qualities? Is it the community or is it the divine in us? I sought inclusiveness as God had pronounced all the divine handiwork to be good. I was convinced that I had to be part of the definition making as being part of what is made in the image and likeness. I have to be at the table. Being woman does not exempt one from that duty. Indeed, God gave the stewardship of creation into the hands of the earth being created male and female in the divine image and likeness. Divinity department became department for the study of religions with Professor C.G. Baita as head. The name change is significant. It arose out of uh, Kwame Nkrumah's philosophy that said, okay, we are an independent country. We don't have to do what the British do. This university is now university in Ghana. We don't have to do what they are doing in, in Britain. Now, um, this department that is called the Department for Divinity sounds very sectarian. And we can't have in Ghana a, a, a department in the university that is only catering for one of the religions. So we have to change the name. So the name was changed to the Department for the Study of Religions. And that name change was done by Noel. For my group, this change of name made very little difference. We went through the London BD program as well as undertook the study of uh, ATR African traditional religion even more intensively. As is usually the case, the curriculum development that I went through in 1959-62 at the department is not quite the same today, but the basic line is there. The core remains as it includes attempts to understand God as revealed in the theistic religions of the Abrahamic tradition and the indigenous religions of Ghana, which had acquired a variety of designations, but now I think has settled for African traditional religion. African traditional religion is the primal religion because it represents the human primal imagination that fuels the human spirit in Africa. Currently, there's a debate. The people, especially the Christians, are challenging the designation traditional religion. And they're asking the question, how long would the people practice a religion before it becomes traditional? And then they have all kinds of debates as to why we should, we should stop tra African traditional religion, because Christianity is also Africa's traditional religion. I, you can see I don't belong to that. <laughs> And the debate is that the Akan say meaning every human being is born with a sense of God in that person. You don't come to this earth to learn that God exists. So they all come in a variety of hues, all the three religions, the Christians, the Muslims, they are all in Ghana, delving into God. We, in Christian studies, we note that, for instance, the word El, which you find at the end of several names, Bethel, things like that, is, is the first section of the name of God, Elohim. Now, it's the same as the Arabic word, Allah. It is the Mesopotamia. Before the creation of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, because Muhammad's father was called Abdul Allah, servant of Allah. Before his son created Islam, who created Islam was born. Onyami was in Ghana, West Africa. Before Christianity arrived to identify Onyami as the Christian or any other African destination. 
God existed in the Arabic Peninsula before Muhammad came to underline the fact that God is the compassionate one called Allah. Now all these names exist for the believer while scholars and others continue to debate as to whether these names refer to one reality. For the believer, these academic debates are interesting as brain teasers. The question is, how do we live as a result of the reality of the beyond? The sacred referred to in this offering, the popular name of God. So I simply use the, the popular name of God, the supreme being, the ultimate reality. Traditionally, in most parts of Africa and uh, Islam and traditional religion, God is Following the change of name in the country and in the university, I, we then substituted divinity and theology with religion. So what I'm talking about when I say the relevance of religion, you can have any number of religions in your head and imagine they're all referring to the one in 1959, I was admitted to the University College of Ghana to do the London BD. When things changed, I ended up getting a certificate, not the London BD that I studied for, but I ended up getting a BA study of religion. This is not what NQK had invited me to. But for me, that was no issue. I had earned a university degree in theology at a state university that was going to change my life. Nonetheless, my father was very disappointed at the outcome and consoled me with, never mind. With a BA, you can go on and earn a BD. And then later I was to discover that this was happening here in America, that people with BAs would then go to Yale or someplace and get a BD. And then they discovered that, well, we have to make some distinction. Let's drop the BD and make it an MD or something like that. Yeah. So the, the name changed. But my father was disappointed. He, he wanted to see a woman, his daughter, having a BD when he also had a BD. The two men who conspired to put my feet on a road scarcely traveled by women must have prayed for my future. Both were active again when after returning from my studies in Cambridge, uh, there was no place for me to fail. That's another long story. <laughs> Christianity, the Christian belief, located in the Bible and all the missionary work has resulted in Africa, specifically Ghana, beginning to behave like there is only one religion and that is Christianity. And that is beginning to cause some problems. The exotic names of churches that have grown out of the African initiatives in Christianity, they seek to advertise boldly the relevance of Christianity to the life of the individual African. Many of these churches in Ghana are founded by Ghanaians, but others are franchises uh, of Nigerian origin. But they all exhibit what human needs they are set up to respond to. It will not be possible for me to give you some pictures of this kind of thing at this sitting, but I believe that if you probe further, if you read John Samuel Kobe or Johnson Kamna, uh, Samuel Jedu, uh, or, or you, you look at names like Musana Disco Crystal Church, or names like Pottersfield Ministry, or Heaven's Gate Church, or Solid Rock, 
or enlightened Christian church and many others, you will see how vibrant Christianity is in Ghana and the rest of Africa and how, I was going to say we Christians, but I'm not too sure, and how the Christians believe that it is Christianity, the only religion that we should be going to. There are religious personalities, usually designated as prophets, who claim to hate the divinities of the indigenous religion, and they lay, lay claim to destroy their powers. Many Christians in Africa also cast aspersions at our ancestors. There's a TV personality who calls himself Osoku Chirakosun, which means the minister who abhors idols. And you have all these people. You have TV Joshua, who opens his church, and I live on the, the road to the road to my house. You cannot pass it, TV Joshua. It's a place. The billboards are showcases for these huge charismatic teachers. They film everything in Ghana. One of them being interviewed uh, on TV just at the time I was trying to put this together. He described himself and his style of communication as being swagalicious. Not <laughs> swagalicious, I would say flamboyant. <laughs> There are several such questions, <coughs> and if you look at the man and the way he's dressed and the way he's speaking, he's an actor. <laughs> I wouldn't say he's a pastor, but who am I to judge? Maybe that's the way to be a pastor. <laughs> the booming African initiatives in Christianity present themselves as battling the principalities and powers, the satanic manifestations, the forces of darkness. Their task is delivering persons from these negative powers whose machinations thwart the well-being of people and they exhibit the power to make the people prosperous. This language is present on storefronts announcing like the lady who uh, announces her office as anointed fingers hairdresser. And you'll find many such. And they're all based on our Christian beliefs. These prophets and men of God are backed by several um, independent indigenous gospel singers, the contents of whose lyrics reflect their Christian faith. They sing of deliverance, they sing of the judgment day, the worship services are full of praise and worship, I don't know what the difference is, but they do. Now, <laughs> this matter seeped into, has seeped into the Western churches, and you will find them in my own very sophisticated Methodist church on the state. Everybody is doing praise and worship. Well, the contemporary landscape demonstrates how the Bible is mined in search of what will enrich the human spirit and our relations with one another. When these African independent churches began, the missionary churches were very disturbed and so were their ministers. Um, I was reading the archives, I saw a letter that my father had written to the Methodist Missionary Society saying, leave these people alone, you know. We don't know what they will become, God only knows. My father had that, the same philosophy as uh, his, his mother. My grandmother is my, my spiritual mentor throughout. And he, when the charismatic churches, the Pentecostal churches came, was always telling people, leave them. The missionary churches were calling the Pentecostal churches, the Abonsen churches, because they were always clapping, they clapped with their music. You know. So my grandmother would say, And that has been my 
theory of inclusiveness. My grandmother was singing way back there in the late 30s. Let them grow up together. Stop castigating others. When the master comes, he will know who belongs to him. So let them grow up together. So even way back then, there was this old woman who knew about inclusiveness and how interreligious living should be. And that has been part of my heritage. The contemporary landscape is full of people who claim biblical knowledge and uh, who quote the Bible and um, give prophecies and so on. Now, the, the Catholic priest, he's now, he's now retired, a priest when he looks at the Christian landscape, he would say that all these prophets and things, they, they include the good, the indifferent, and the downright evil that they all may be encountered in the Christian space in Ghana. The, one of these tra biblical translations that were done in Africa, they managed to make 1 Corinthians 11, 1 to 16, become sexist. They quote this passage and they, they say women should wear veils, not as a sign of subordination to men, but as a sign of their authority to pray and prophesy precisely as Christian women, not as imitation of men. But you, you open the Greek Bible at this passage, and this business of explaining why women should cover their head and not blah, 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 it's not there. <laughs> but they put it there to emphasize the subordination of women and trying to make it good, say, no, 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 it's not because you are imitating it, because God wants you to do your own thing whilst you are still wearing the hijab. Christians of all denominations are making sure that they are identified. The simple greeting, um, how do you do or how are you? Normally we would say in my language, by the grace of God. Now, by the grace of God in Ghana, now among the Christians, it's not enough. You have to say by the grace of Jesus Christ to make sure that everybody knows you are Christian and not a Muslim or traditionalist. The, the, the interreligious scene in Africa is becoming um, not, not so palatable. We've had a couple of heads of state who has tried to say that their countries are Christian countries. Well, um, luckily they were not able to do it because there were people who uh, refused to have that. I focused on this religion thing because religion, interreligious living has become an issue everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. The recent experiences, I don't have to tell you what I'm referring to, they all show that it is an area that religion ought to be able to penetrate Christian thinking, the thinking of Muslims, the thinking of everybody, to, to be able to sing the song that my grandmother sings. Let them grow up together. Only God knows what is going on and what is good for our humanity. Mm -hmm. So, let me come back to why call women into theology. One of the joys of the evening of my life is the interest that is now being shown in the participation of women in the church, especially as ordained ministers. I marvel at men actually coming to me for conversations when they are looking for topics to research on women or people that can go and interview when they are working on women. Um, I have actually just finished the preface for a man who is writing to enable to his church to consider ordination of women. And that makes me feel that 
Um, the little conversation with Noel King at my school with chalk in my hands and face is very good. Even the men are beginning to realize that the women have to be part of God's work. One of the, the researchers that I'm in conversation with now is experiencing or experienced what we all as girls experienced at school. Everybody is asking when, when you are choosing your subjects at school, they bring um, counselors, career counselors, to tell you if you take such and such a subject, it is this way and so on. Well, if you take physical education, it was supposed to be one of the soft options, you can become uh, a coach, even if you are a man or a woman. But nobody mentions religion. Nobody mentions Bible knowledge. Because where is that taking you? So I'm having a conversation with this girl who says, um, physical education, I'm going to part of her, says, BK may stimulate interest in the ordained ministry for boys, but for girls, it holds no prospects. And then she says, now look at me. After bachelor's and master's in philosophy and pedagogy, I have launched into theology, and thus have discovered you, and I'm sitting at your feet, trying to find out what theology has meant in your life. So, it paid for somebody to tell me, I think you should be coming to do theology. Because more and more people are benefiting from that single act. What is the purpose of education is something that we all, as educationists, we keep debating. In 1958, Noel King was in search of students for the Department of Divinity. And I was one of the students that he picked and sent to the university. Why study theology when you will not be ordained was the question I never put to myself, but which others put to me when I was encouraging women to go into theological studies, where will it lead me to if I do not want to teach? I always waffled in my responses because I really didn't know where you could lead anybody to. I will say you will expand your understanding of human nature to help in your relationship with others. And who knows, it may even earn you a human relations position in an institution. In those days, they were called personnel officers, but now it's different. Now, all this aside, the question why direct women into theological studies is predicated on the assumption that it is for ministerial formation. And as most churches are not inclined that way, they even make sure that you know that they don't need a woman to religion. Theology is to be avoided if one does not want to be alienated from the church and worse, even jeopardize your faith. Chrissy Dixon, one of the people who is also in Noel's list, had come to me and said, Mercy, I'm going to propose you for the ministry to the church. I said, leave me out of this. I, I said to him, I don't have the call. And he said, you have you've always been a naughty girl. I said, no, I'm sorry. I don't have the call to preach, but I have the call to teach, to be in the, in the teaching ministry. Mm -hmm. It wasn't something that a woman spontaneously would go and do. But here I was, doing just that. What I know is that Noel was conscious of having been instrumental for producing the first woman in Africa to obtain an honors degree in theology from the university. Together with Christian Baita, who succeeded him as head of department, they bettered me, and together with Maurice Wiles of Cambridge, uh, I think who is the reason why you have seen so many books from me? Maurice Wiles says, 
Nobody is going to put you before any place for heresy. There's nothing like heresy. If you are a heretic, it's because you take your faith seriously and you are examining it and trying to see how it affects life. So whatever you want to say, you can say it. Your conclusion, like my conclusion in the area debate was that areas of right. Because if uh, we hadn't had all this hula ban, we would not still be having debates as to the meaning of the Trinity. And on Trinity Sunday, people stand up in church and say, the Trinity, is, and then they give all kinds of imagery, and they end up by saying it is a mystery. <laughs> and they are telling areas we will be in. Okay, all right. So, <laughs> so thanks to these men, African women now feel comfortable in theology, and African men are beginning to feel and act as people who are not threatened by the presence and participation of women in theology. Mm -hmm. Now, while I was in Leven, um, I, I always belonged to some people or the other. I was with the Christian Fellowship people, and they really felt sorry for me that I was studying theology. Uh, I happened to have gone straight from a lecture to one of our meetings, and I was explaining Daniel, the book of Daniel, and doing our theological this and that for it. And they all said, oh my God, our sister is lost. And they sat around, and in the round, the prayer circle that we made, everybody was praying for me. Dear Lord, please do not let our sister Mercy ruin her faith with theological studies. I did not know at that time that there was a myth that says when we die, we arrive at a forked road. One is marked to theology and hell, <laughs> and the other to faith and heaven. <laughs> so when it came to my turn to pray, I did not pray. I just quietly left the room, and I went to put on my dancing rock and went to dance which was all part of what they were praying against that I shouldn't be doing. So I went to do exactly that. And then they came to the department the following morning with a list of 10 affirmations. Uh, two people brought them. Can you sign this? Because actually I was one of the founders of the group. Right? <laughs> Can you sign this? And I read and I said, thank you. I know whom I have been. And all three of those took the stone silent. I never signed on that dotted line that I am saved. But I was quoting scripture. And I knew my friends could complete what I had said. Theological studies, I believe, has established and enriched my faith. It has made me keenly aware of my accountability to the source of all beings. I live believing and acting as one who asserts that God gives human beings the power of creativity and compassion. Mm -hmm. We are given the ability to lead, which does not include domination and preying on others. Our being in the image and likeness of God requires standing in solidarity with others and in partnership for achieving the common good the fullness of life for all for which Jesus came. I live daily conscious of the demand to live out the ethics of my faith, always conscious of the beyond, what is going to happen after, even what is going to happen after this lecture. I live for that, <laughs> the beyond. I need to contribute to the task about the fullness of life to humanity and maintaining the integrity of all. Whether women can earn a living by studying theology is no longer a concern. Some of those who cornered the sacramental ministry and reserved it for men have relented. Religious programs attest to this. Women TV preachers, gospel singers are commonplace in, in Africa today. Women create prayer camps and offer deliverance ministries. One only needs to experience the gathering of women at Glow. I think at Glow began here in the 
U.S. But if you see a girl in Ghana, where all the stadia are full of women praying for the country. Billboards in Accra advertise Christian activities, and the TV is also doing the same. And they all have women, and nobody is now asking why are we doing this? It has become accepted. In Daughters of Hanoa, I had a chapter that says that women were clients of religion. Now I am beginning to change my mind because some of the women have also become like the, the, like the men of God, doing exactly what the men were doing, are doing to get the money. They are all there today. Today, the question why women in theology is not being asked. It is normal. The glass ceiling of ordination remains in some churches, but even some of those are open for debate. In 1959, however, it was groundbreaking to see a woman in the inter-BD class. None anticipated that it would become ground-shaking. By 1966, it had become clear that Ghana the church, the academy, had no use for a woman with a tripos part three. By then, I was back teaching in school, and NQK waded in just as I later I came to know my father did, and writer did, everybody was running around saying, we cannot do this. We cannot produce a woman of this level of theological studies and not find way. Again, why I didn't I wasn't pleased with another story. Okay. <laughs> now, NQK waited and he found a position for me in Makerere University where he was. I could not join him. I was so sad. I had gone from Cape Coast. My parents were in 70, so I went to say goodbye to my father. And he said, you know, why don't you want to stay in Ghana? Okay, I, I know Noel, and that will take care of you. But he's a stranger. If anything happens in Uganda, uh, in Uganda, he cannot protect you because he cannot protect himself. If anything happens, I was really torn. But I came back and sent a cable to Noel to say there are tears standing in my father's eyes, so I cannot. I make bold to say that that one single visit shaped my life, shaped the lives of several people. And it's the reason why, although I had promised myself no more travel and no more gallivanting around the US having a nice time, mm -hmm. I thought, you know, if this has to do with Noel, even if I can't walk, I will be there. Noah called me into the study of divinity. I was instrumental in getting African women in, uh, involved in theological studies in order to help African theology to have a second wing and fly. That is to become holistic. I have not done a serious study of what the second wing to African theology has meant. And it will be interesting to research and compare what African theology has become since the women week. I know that if you look at the Jesus, the teachings around the Hagar Sarah story, you will find that the women tell it differently. If you look at the story of the Levites, wives took differently. Oh, just simply look at the image that you get from the pulpits and the, most of the men's theology on the persistent woman, the woman who was not getting justice. She knocks and knocks and knocks. And the picture would have been given to date. It comes from the conclusion of that story that. Wouldn't God give us what we want? Okay, 
You know, we the African women know what we're saying. The person who is knocking, the woman who is knocking, is God. Because it is following parables in which God is a woman looking for a lost earring, a woman, you know. So this too, God is a woman knocking at the door of our human hearts because we are unjust and God has been pleading you human beings to justice. And God will continue to knock on our doors until we do justice. So the women coming into jail are giving new eyes to the reading of the Bible. And I think um, when, when I talk about my saintly mentor, I'm not the only one who does this. In a recent publication called Giving Account of Faith and Hope by John Samuel Kobe, John Kobe writes, Odiyoye was a contemporary of mine in the Department of Divinity, University of Ghana, and the Divinity School, the University of Cambridge. We were influenced by the same professors, particularly Noel Q. King and Christian G. Baita. They were our parents in the academy, and we grew there as siblings. NQK fostered community among the students who, because of how we related to him, also saw ourselves as siblings. NQK did not leave our lives when we left Lebanon, when he left Lebanon. He kept up with us in correspondence and even took an extensive pilgrimage to visit his students when he was nearing the end of his active teaching. Whatever this day and the King Lectures intend to do, my burden is to acknowledge that NQK was at the root of what I have become. And he was a man. Women's theology in Africa cannot be labeled sexist or anti-men. In the circle of concerned African women theologians, we are encouraging the probing of the concept of masculinities and the fear of feminism. We in the circle are working for an inclusive community of women and men, all created in the image and likeness of God. The task I set myself, having come under the influence of Noel Quentin King, is to participate in growing a theology that inspires all humanity to honor one another and to be humble enough to acknowledge the divine in all you.